Just throwing the table in the back. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks. Perfect. You have more back there, right? On your hand? Okay. Right, great. Okay, so we, we're getting ready to start. We don't want to run late. Hello, my name is Jason Winfrey. I'm a uh, professor of philosophy at California State University Stanislaus. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here and uh, participate uh, in this event. Um, it's a real pleasure to put names and faces together, to see the faces and hear the voices of uh, people who uh, you, know, you read in print. And uh, there's a kind of vitality to that. Um, it's also a real pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor uh, Charles Scott. Uh, he's an emeritus professor from Vanderbilt University. Um, professor Scott has written a number of books. Uh, the ones that come most readily to mind uh, for me are The uh, Question of Ethics, which won the Choice Book Award, The Time of Memory, um, The Lives of Things, and Living with Indifference. Um, these books, I think, all have a kind of arc or trajectory. Uh, that is, I think they have something in common that allows them to have a trajectory. Um, they're characterized by an attention to the formation of values and the weight that those values carry in shaping, forming, and deforming our lives, experiences, and capacities for thinking. Um, that is to say, these books have a uh, remarkable attention to um, uh, the moments in our experience and our thinking and our lives that vector values that are at stake in the production and even the contestation of those same experiences. Uh, this work has led uh, to uh, the crystallization, I think, of a number of uh, terms where these, uh, uh, this movement happens. Uh, some of those terms are um, indifference, another term that uh, shows up occasionally is the word freedom. I think that that's a nice uh, uh, place, in fact, to see the site of a potential uh, dialogue and discussion with all of these issues that uh, Professor Bussell has raised concerning um, liberation. And um, I think I'll leave it at that and uh, say that it's my pleasure to welcome Charles Scott here. Does everybody have a copy who wants one of the paper? Uh, they are available. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to have heard your presentation, Professor Bussell, um, and to participate in this kind of conference, which I think is on the forefront of uh, developments that have been needed for a long time and that are now beginning <coughs> gaining a certain kind of uh, momentum. And this conference, I think, is part of that momentum. So I'm grateful also to Alejandro and to the University of Oregon in uh, developing this and being on the forefront. Uh, <coughs> the title of this paper, as you know, is Freedom and Oppression in North America. <coughs> I note at the beginning that Canada is certainly a definitive part of North America. And I will address issues related only to the lineages and practices in the United States and its native and continental, uh, sorry, colonial predecessors. That colonial predecessors, which plays a significant role in the first part of the paper, is the reason why I had difficulty calling this uh, freedom and oppression in the United States. I adopt this approach in part <coughs> because of the limits of the rel this relatively short paper and in part because of the history of the United States and its connection with countries and cultures to its south. I want to start with two definitions. Cruel means, dictionary-wise, Disposition to inflict pain, disposition, disposed. Uh, that disposed is going to be a key word throughout the paper. Disposed to inflict pain or suffering. And that word disposed will not be limited simply to individuals. Devoid of human feelings, 
causing or conducive to injury, grief, or pain, un <coughs> unrelieved by leniency. Mercy implies compassion that forbears. In other words, it will play a role, particularly in the latter part of the paper. Compassion that forbears punishing even when justice demands it. Benevolence and goodwill shown in broad understanding and tolerance of others. Susan Sontag said in a frequently quoted soundbite from a television interview in 2004, 10% of any population is cruel, no matter what. And 10% is merciful, no matter what. And the remaining 80% can be moved in either direction. Although I think her speculation is optimistic in its numbers and in its qualifying phrase, no matter what, I take her points that most people can be swayed to act with more or less cruelty, that people can intend to be merciful, and that merciful actions can indeed happen. At this introductory moment, I would like to focus our attention on cruelty as I address the issue of ethics, freedom, and oppression in North America. Mercy will come later. I assume that everyone here is aware of at least some of the lineages of cruelty that infect our institutions, moralities, religions, forms of relation, authoritative knowledge, guiding images, and economic systems. I do not know if anyone here or everyone here agrees with me that our species is inclined to cruelty, at least in some circumstances, and that cruel situations in the sense of conditions conducive to injury, grief, or pain are fundamentally important for most and probably all ethical issues. In this paper, I will assume that all types of oppression, all types of oppression of people are cruel that some measures of freedom for people in their vast number of differences is required for them to thrive, and that human thriving is the fundamental issue for ethics. I will also assume that I, a North American white older male who has never lived for longer than six weeks in Mexico, Central America, or South America, must speak out of my particular cultural heritage and experiences. To assume a position of authority in the form of unqualified ethical judgments regarding values and practices in other cultures can itself constitute an insidious inclination, inclination to advance and produce destructive and cruel values. I understand one part of this conference's purpose to be cultivation of language, thought, feelings, and images that counteract such values. These assumptions mean that while I doubt the accuracy of Sontag's statement that 10% of all people, regardless of circumstances, are merciful, I take very seriously her observation that most people can be moved away from directions toward cruelty, toward cruel actions and situations. Enhancing that movement is a major challenge to us when we consider ethics in the Americas. A few reminders, and I'm sure that most of you know far more about things I will only touch on as reminders, as cues, basically, um, prompts. <coughs> but I want to get at least this out on the table as a basis for wider thought. I'm beginning with a sense of intimate interconnections among individuals, traditions, or lineages and institutions as I emphasize the issue of cruelty in this paper. Broadly, it's the notion of being in the world and with a certain angle that Professor Gassel mentioned in his, in his discussion. Cruelty is not simply a matter of personal intentions or special inheritance, species inheritance. It can be found in broadly accepted social practices that form individuals such as slavery, prescribed torture, merciless marginalization and exploitation. Lineages of cruelty can function in people's sense of justice and punishment, in our senses of reasonable conquest, reasonable conquest, decency, and forced learning. Such lineages also function in the often erotic dimensions of domination, 
the infliction of pain, the physicality of some sports, and the entertaining portrayal of violent, fierce narratives. I want to recall the cruelty that was commonplace in early white North American colonies. <clears throat> I note that many of the early co colonies allowed and encouraged chattel slavery by the beginning of the 17th century and before African Americans entered this country in 1619 for the first time. Indentured service converted to slavery when the service people, including young boys and girls, were defined as property. In 1609, for example, Henry Spellman, a white man, was sold to a group of Native Americans by Captain John Smith in the same year Thomas Savage was traded to Native Americans for one of their own servants. Before 1619, there were approximately 250,000 indentured servants in the colonies, many of whom, quote, were kidnapped, others lured under false pretenses, coerced or entrapped. They were hoisted onto auction, uh, auction blocks. These are white, primarily British people. Hoisted onto auction blocks where they were stripped, examined, and sold without regard for separation from family. They were thought to be contented with their lot, lazy and immoral. Female servants were sexually exploited by masters and not all so victimized were adults. Records show the arrival of 1,500, quote, friendless boys and girls who were expropriated to work in the colonies. The authorities were so pleased with their services, they have pleaded for more. In North America at that time, the colonialized citizens could thus own their servants, whip them at will, control the marriages of female servants, and sell women for wives. With the advent of black slaves, Massachusetts was the first colony to recognize slavery of both white and black people by statute. With increasing economic dependence on them, with increasing uh, economic dependence on them came increasingly oppressive and violent practices that included brutal beatings, hanging, various forms of torture, and burning at the stake. Violent anti-Semitism was rampant. Many North Americans were enslaved by, colonia, uh, by colonial citizens, while in most native tribes, slavery and torture were also commonplace. And all of this among a colonial people and indigenous people who were yearning to be free. I note these dreary details that only scratch the surface of institutionalized cruelty in early North America to indicate something about the lineage to which I belong and which I and many other North Americans think and feel. This country was formed in a struggle for freedom and in practices, this country was formed in a struggle for freedom and in practices of many types of enslavement. That strange combination characterized this country when it became independent, and it continues to characterize many of the definitive policies that the United States government carries out with the support of a significant number of its citizens. These policies and practices, inclusive of economic expansion and influence, are, in my opinion, directly relevant to our topic. They are particularly relevant because they reflect the lineage that combines a struggle for freedom and a struggle to oppress, and if not to enslave, at least to control and exploit other people and cultures. I think you cannot separate that in the North American mind, ethos, lineage, this com strange combination, I think you cannot separate the value of freedom and the importance of oppression at the same time. Finally, in these introductory remarks, I would like to note as well an aspect of my own personal experience that will be relevant in several places in this discussion. <clears throat> my maternal step-great-grandmother was a member of the Choctaw tribe and in 1831 was in the first wave of the Trail of Tears consequent to President Andrew Jackson's resolve 
<coughs> pardon me, to remove most Native Americans from southeastern United States to Indian Territory, later known as Oklahoma. Five tribes were part of that trail that continued for almost a decade. My step-great-grandmother was a young girl when she and her family resettled in the southeastern part of the territory. Her granddaughter was the only maternal grandparent I knew, and I had many conversations with her and her adult sons on annual summer visits to what we call the Featherston Ranch. I was raised in the capital of the Seminole Indian Nation, Rewoka, Oklahoma, and grew up with Indian, and I have a footnote here, Indian is an honorific term in many areas where I was raised and continues to be. And I'm going to switch between Indian and uh, Native American because s some people who prefer Indian do not like being called Native Americans. Uh, so there's a controversy, and I'm going to just play it out without taking sides. As I worked at my father's grocery store, I learned some Seminole words and phrases so I could help older customers who either could not or would not speak English. I also grew up with Indian stories and lore, and my imagination was fired by the recent, recently passed frontier days of that region of the country. In addition, I also have a paternal ancestor, probably in the early 19th century, who is what is called Black Dutch, a person of Indian, black, and white mixed blood, as it was called in those days. I mention these details in part because in my innocence then, I wanted to be both Indian and white, or at least to be accepted by the Indians I knew as one of them. But I was white and raised to be white, even with my step-grandmother and uncles. There was a silence. This, this experience of silence is going to play a role, a much larger role later. There was a silence beyond a certain point, a silence that I now believe marked a boundary between which a white person in Oklahoma at that time could, beyond which a white person in Oklahoma at that time could not go with understanding or empathy. The silence arose, I believe, from a mixture of feelings, lore, rhythms, native language, and ways of life that originated in deep tribal identity and a dimension of experienced lineage that carried memories of being free to be Choctaw, Seminole Creek, Chickasaw, or Cherokee. In those memories, embedded in tribal lore and manners of living, embodied memories of being forced to live in a strange land and under the control of strange laws and social practices. It was a silence that marked memories of both freedom and enforced constraint. People could dull those nonverbal senses with alcohol or amalgamation into white culture. Only when I came to accept this, only when I came to accept the silence, however, was I able to know obvious but a painful facts that silent, the silence I experienced from Indian friends and relatives at the time I was growing up meant that they, to be free in some important sense, needed to accept themselves as Indians on their own terms whatever those terms were, whatever that means, and they could not be represented in white sensibility without distortion and in the representation a measure of oppression that could spawn other forms of oppression. If I may <coughs> emphasize that by rereading. What I came to s think I understood is that the, they needed to accept themselves as Indians, and this was part of the silence. On their own terms, wherever they were, whatever that means, and they could not be represented, they could not be understood, they could not be systematized, they could not be intellectualized, they could not be grasped by someone like me, uh, a philosopher, or just an ordinary person in Oklahoma at the time. They could not be represented in a white sensibility without distortion. And in the, rep in the representation, by virtue of that very act, a measure of oppression that could spawn other forms of oppression. That very act of representing could easily, and I think in many instances did, and in official and unofficial ways, spawn additional and further and snowballing uh, uh, forms of oppression. I believe that attunement 
to boundaries similar, similar to those that I experienced are also found in much larger frameworks and is crucial for many of our issues at this conference. That's the, the attunement to boundaries. <coughs> Those boundaries, at a bare minimum, will involve possibilities for both freedom and loss of freedom. They will mark the limits within which people can find their own styles and rhythms of expression, as well as manners of life that arise in their sensibilities and lineages. Those boundaries <coughs> mark the regions for the formation of capacities to feel and know as they do. Those boundaries mark the formation of capacities to feel and know as they do. They mark the dispositional bases for their communal mind. I also believe that in periods of cultural amalgamation, such capacities among various peoples will also include a significant measure of loss, of transformative removal, if you will, in relation to such images as those of originary times and an essential identity. We experience such loss in those periods and something like an empty silence that goes with them on a daily basis as we work and socialize in environments that are formed by a, a culture significantly different from our own. I think of people, for example, who are educated in those different cultures' schools, in Oklahoma at that time in white schools, who work in their professions, who as domestic staff and day laborers must appropriate ways of life that are strange to them, are those who move from poverty to middle class status in this country. There are many examples of some people and some people in them lose their sense of cultural grounding. They lose their souls, you might say, their sense of basic values as they struggle to succeed and win the recognition that is offered on the surface of their new milieu and occasionally to find equally superficial beliefs or to make futile efforts of reactionary return to a mythological past that provide relief from the silence of loss that pervades their lives. How might we address such issues of living together in our profound and frequently misattuned differences with other people as well as with ourselves? Are there ways to mitigate the multiple cruelties of oppression in cultural amalgamations and the clash of cultures in a country of borderlands? Is the expectation of enhancing mercy in such situations naive? Is an emphasis on mercy misplaced in context of freedom and oppression? How might we think of cultural boundaries and questions of freedom and oppression? I've used the word freedom in several different senses. On the one hand, I've spoken of freedom as opposed to enslavement and gross oppression. That usage suggests the likelihood that the owners and the oppressors are free. The colonial men, for example, were at least free to travel without a master's oversight. They were free to own property, to build their homes, learn to read, to own weapons. They were free to oppress their wives, children, animals, and human property. They were free in many situations to act with cruelty. On the other hand, I have spoken of freedom in the context of being able to live in accord with individuals' cultural dispositional home base. Finally, I have said that a purpose in ethical investigation and thought, as I understand it, is to develop language images, concepts, and feelings that allow and enhance, that is to say, make way for differences of sensibilities that are beyond our grasp. I'll say more about the meaning of sensibility in this paper in section two. This kind of ethical development itself constitutes a type of freedom and perhaps mercy that we might call 
freedom for differences, and it would be quite distinct to language, images, concepts, and feelings that represent and generate lineages and practices of oppression in relation to significant cultural differences. Cultivating freedom for differences would be an exceptionally complex undertaking. Since all of us live in, inage, in lineages that comprise many types of oppression and cruelty. Cultural boundaries constitute one aspect of this complexity. These boundaries occur not only when people interact with others who have significantly different cultural sensibilities, they also occur in individual lives. I believe the Native Americans in early and mid-20th mid century Oklahoma showed this kind of personal experience of cultural boundaries, although I assume that this kind of experience is found by millions of people in North America who live in quite distinct di cultures. Many Haitians in the United States, for example, are first and second generation Africans who now live in the United States. Chicanos, people who live in poverty, many, many others. The two initial points that I want to make are that cultural boundaries mark regions of profound difference in which people know themselves in shared lineages of sensibility and that living attuned to those ways of life, living attuned to those ways of life constitutes one kind of freedom. This freedom can be expressed as senses of shared identity found in daily practices and rhythms, common recognitions and many types of art, including <coughs> inclusive of dance, songs, painting, and poetry. It is freedom to enact differences from other cultures in one's own social environment. I pointed out at the beginning of this paper a lineage within which <coughs> I live that was formed in an intimate connection of freedom and oppression by Europeans who came to North America with the hope of being able to live in their own sensibilities and to own their own land without social or governmental interference. In this search for freedom, however, came practices of terrible oppression that blindly followed inherited lineages of cruelty and forms of enslavement. These lineages thrived in the tribal removals, removals that were inclusive of the tribe's own slaves, to Indian territory and persisted in my own experiences with Native American family, friends, and family. Further, both white North American and North American cultures in the early 20th century held deeply embedded memories of cruel practices of enslavement and torture. I'm emphasizing the fact that strong feelings for individual and social freedom accompanied impersonal lineages of oppression and cruelty from the earliest founding of that part of North America as it developed into what we now know as the United States. I am also saying that I am aware of living in that complex lineage and that my participation in it will have a bearing on what I think and say in this paper. Section two, how should we respond to practices and values that are abhorrent to us? <coughs> how are we to behave in relation to cultures whose values we find generative of terrible oppression and injustice. Cultures, <coughs> pardon me, cultures of slavery and entrenched, debilitating class structures. Cultures that require in their policies the continuation of massive poverty. Do we ignore them, let them be? Do we work to slowly transform them? Do we find ways to oppress them, to take away their oppressive powers? to fracture their oppressive sensibilities, either convert them by economic, social, and educational means or force them to turn in a transformative direction? Do we use a measure of our freedom to take away a measure of their freedom? I do not want to make a transcendental turn at this point <coughs> and contend that universal laws and duties that are dependent on human cultures and history for, form a basis for the justification of some values and actions and not other values and actions. 
In the areas of freedom and oppression, of mercy and cruelty, people can act individually and with answerability to their own choices within lineages and cultures that constitute them in their sensibilities. They can say, for example, that human beings should be treated as though they have fundamental rights that others should not violate. That particular affirmation is, definitive, is a definitive part of the United States constitutional heritage. And they can also say that they are willing to use the most effective means possible to neutralize certain kinds of practices that they find to be in violation of their core values concerning other people. I affirm also without qualification, for example, that the United States government should submit to critique by its citizens and others and should neutralize those systematic economic policies that directly or indirectly support conditions conducive to poverty in all countries, inclusive particularly of the United States. That affirmation will very likely require oppression of people who belong to some oppressing social groups and in some ways of life. I affirm, too, the use of force. You see, I'm combining this sense of freedom and oppression right now in that judgment. I affirm, too, the use of force when necessary to eliminate institutional forms of slavery, such as that of human trafficking of children and adult prostitution, prostitutes, the practices of some white supremacists and neo-Nazi groups, gangs and mobsters who control people by extortion, murder, and torture. Those form individual uh, subcultures, many of them. With such conviction, I am carrying out in an individual way, without transcendental justification, the freedom oppression complex that is indigenous to my culture. I am affirming some instances of radical encroachment on the borders of some other ways of life. And in those affirmations, I am answerable both to the complex lineage in which I live and to my choices that elevate some parts of that lineage above other parts. I am affirming in the context of this paper <coughs> instances of cruelty. Three, how might we evaluate choices like those I have highlighted? Sensibilities, as I'm using the word, names the complex of feelings, dispositions, preferences, guiding images, basic meanings, normative values, definitive conceptual forms, manners of self-presentation, the ensemble of mental, spiritual, and affective factors that broadly define a group of people or set them apart from other groups of people. All these constituents make a heavier burden than any word can bear, carry. But the word sensibility might be able to function as a sign for the mind and spirit that allow people who share a culture to know and be who they are together. Sensibilities are dynamic in the sense that they are affected by all manner of events, such as influences from other cultures, conflictual differences within their own makeup, significant environmental changes and new problems or opportunities that emerge from discoveries of new realities, technological innovations and new problems that require confrontation and resolution. But with all, our sensibilities are like the air we breathe in the sense that they function even when we reflect on them or attempt to change some aspect of them. The complexity of differences with sensibilities and other mutational factors allow people a measure of what I will call internal transcendence of their sensibilities. This conflict, um, we could start speaking of the margins, for example, uh, within certain sensibilities. There, there is a dynamic factor of change within the very occurrence of sensibilities is what I'm saying in shorthand. A person or persons might, for example, choose to intensify the force of some value, or they might affirm the, op the opposites of certain of their culture's definitive factors. For example, choose to act in a way that is distinctly ill-mannered in a particular culture. But people nonetheless live with the sensibility that at least defines some of the definitive limits in a culture's life, whether or, no, whether or not those limits are affirmed or opposed. 
It is also true that people who are oppressed or marginalized in a culture are paradoxically often more available for options outside the dominant sensibilities range than those who live more deeply within its folds of opportunity. Finally, I note that the word sensibility refers to a mental, spiritual, affective region that bears lineages, many of which have distinct and sometimes contradictory trajectories of influence. All kinds of contradictions and irreconcilables are functioning within a certain organized sensibility. These lineages of behavior, belief, institutional structures, and so forth are culturally and impersonally alive in a culture's engraved memories, forceful images, lore, and myths, authoritative knowledge, and forms of power. So all of these centered, focused kinds of elements within a sensibility are themselves creased, seen by all manner of, of differences of lineages that play the role. So you've got a very, at the depth, a very chaotic and changeable kind of situation that constitutes what we experience as the fundamental base for our living together with recognition and understanding. With these remarks on sensibilities, I intend to set the context for evaluating live options that we confront on questions of freedom, oppression, cruelty, and mercy. When we are alert to the pervasive force of our own culture's sensibility, we have carried out a difficult condition for being able to allow, without interference, the occurrence of different sensibilities, even when some aspects of those differences are incomprehensible to us. I've been reading for a while, droning on, let me go over that, that turning sentence again. When we are alert to the pervasive force of our own culture's sensibility, we have carried out a difficult condition for being able to allow without interference the occurrence of different sensibilities, even when some aspects of those differences are incomprehensible to us. This kind of allowance can be alert to the kind of silence that I naively and imperceptibly experienced with Indian friends and family. In such allowance, we let the difference be its difference and the silence to be silent. We forbear. We carry out goodwill with differences that we either do not comprehend or find opposed to our own meanings and values. This prejudgmental allowance constitutes neither agreement nor disagreement. It does constitute an alertness to cultural borders and makes possible cross-cultural connections without invasive encroachment. I said in the last, last section that I support for ethical reasons the use of force to neutralize some conditions of enslavement and other forms of oppression. I find in those instances of encroachment that the value of freedom for oppressed individuals trumps the freedom of the oppressors to oppress, and that a type of mercy for the oppressed trumps mercy for the oppressors. The justification for those decisions arises in part in those cultural lineages of Western values that support individuals' rights to live with a measure of autonomy that is seldom fulfilled for most people, but the image of which nevertheless functions as an ideal in our society. Individual free autonomy, the opposite of which is enslavement and oppression, is one major value in the, I interpolate, Western lineage in which I live. That means also that turning oppressors into the oppressed, which I have affirmed in some instances, is questionable within the sensibility I am addressing. 
You will notice that some values and ideals that originated primarily in Western Europe with its complex lineages have functioned axiomatically in this discussion. Although they are not Eurocentric, they are clearly North American and formed in the strong influence of European knowledge and practices. North America obviously has its own history of conquest and oppression, a history that includes many countries to its south. And it has a history of increasing social pluralization. This is going to be a big point. It has a history of increasing social pluralization due to a large number of immigrants as well as diversified black and native uh, populations who have formed communities with lineages different from those that came out of the early colonies and states. The United States does not have one central sensibility, analogous to the image of Eurocentrism in the 18th and 19th centuries. Its present hallmarks include a blind faith in the rightness of democratic systems and a broad emphasis on the importance of individual autonomy, of capital, education, technological progress, and the priority of North American interests in global economy. In its cultural diversity, however, it is closer to a situation that Gloria and Soldua calls borderlands than it is to a unified state or society. Culturally, it is a grouping of many contiguous and diverse communities that often have extremely different lineages of practice and belief. It is a land of borders among groups that lack a single culture that unifies them. In making the judgment I made concerning encroachments into cultures that I find intolerably oppressive, and as I individualized a type of sensibility that is in a lineage of inclusive, uh, inclusive of irreconcilable tensions between oppression and freedom in the founding of this country, I emphasized as well as expressed the value of individual autonomy and the importance of diversity. I affirmed cultural differences that inhere in the borderland society of this country. I believe that these judgments make sense in that context. They feel right to me in their accord with privileging a type of democratic freedom, freedom not to be enslaved, for example. I believe also that my privileging sensibility in connection with ethical judgments is in accord with a borderland society and with a prioritized respect for distinct and in some ways incomprehensible cultural differences except for those that cruelly oppress other people. Fourth section, final section, borderlands experience. In this final section, I turn to a different voice, one that has overcome multiple types of oppression in the United States and found her freedom here as she found herself to be a person of borders. I find Gloria Anseldua's experience especially important as she recognizes and accepts her borderlands culture and shows in a striking way, in spite of huge differences of content, a form of cultural intermixing that I believe to be a hallmark of North American society. She communicates with a type of freedom that can develop when people own and cultivate their distinct sensibilities in this society even when those sensibilities have profoundly contradictory lineages composing them. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with her writings. I will provide a few reminders as I bring her experience into the present discussion. In her words, the actual physical borderlands that I'm dealing with in this book is the Texas, United States, Southwest Mexican border. The psychological borderlands, this is still her, the sexual borderlands and the spiritual borderlands are not particular to the Southwest. In fact, the borderlands are physically present wherever two or more cultures edge each other, where people of different races occupy the same territory, where under, lower, middle, and upper classes touch, where the space between individuals shrinks with intimacy. 
where the space between individuals shrinks with intimacy. Continuing, I am a border woman. I grew up between two cultures, the Mexican with the heavy Indian influence and the Anglo as a member of a colonialized people in our territory. Hatred, anger, and exploitation are permanent features of this landscape. Living on borders and in margins, keeping intact one's shifting and multiple identity and integrity is like trying to swim in a new element, an alien element. And this is an instance of someone accepting her own sensibility in such a way that you, she's going to become an archetype of what I'm calling message. You recall, this is me, you recall that to her Chicano, Mestiza, culture were lineages of often cruel male domination that in everyday terms meant enslavement of wives and daughters, homophobia, colonial suppression, widely accepted belief in white supremacy, the tyranny, she calls it terrorism, of English and Spanish languages, Greek myths, and the alien, in her words, Western Cartesian split point of view. Her ethnic identity comprised all those elements in addition to Indian lineages. She found herself and her ethos in the conjunction of many borders. She also found that her freedom required her discovery of what she calls her native tongue that comprises many languages, the gods who lived in her lineages, and above all, in art that would overcome the tradition of Mestiza silence. I believe that she experienced and expressed an important kind of mercy in the process of discovering and helping to form and share with all people what she calls a new consciousness out of an indelibly ambiguous identity. This new consciousness is one that she calls one of inclusivity, one that she names a consciousness of the borderlands. She says at the end of her preface, but we Chicanos no longer feel that we need to beg inference, that we need always to make the first overture to translate to Anglos, Mexicans, and Latinos, apology blurting out of our mouths with every step. Today we ask to be met halfway. She's not asking for conquest. This book is our invitation to you from a new, from the new Mestiza. These brave, and this is me again, these brave and kind words give expression to a new consciousness. It is an inclusive, hybrid one that is alien in environments founded on images of purity, racial or class superiority, or habitual gender sex-based oppression. She is allowing those factors in the lineages and languages that inhabit her consciousness. She is allowed, she's recognizing there they are and they're in me. She is allowing those factors in the lineages and languages that inhabit her consciousness. And she is undergoing their transformation as she also allows their mutating confluence with opposing and radically different lineages. In this remarkable process, she extends her hand of invitation to us, others, many of whom represent oppression in her life, to meet her halfway and join consciously in the borderlands experience where we have blindly lived. In the terms of this paper, she is inviting us into opportunities to become aware of our own hybrid lineages, to allow transformations to occur as many often contradictory traditional factors modify each other, to accept ourselves in our fluidity and ambiguity. We not only live in a pluralistic <laughs> borderlands country, we also, we are also ourselves borderlands people. In these processes of what she considers self-acceptance and a growing, quote, tolerance for contradictions and ambiguity. We will be able to reach out to such people as the Mestizas whose lives have been a blur to us, hardly noticed, if noticed at all. Anseldua finds herself to be an Indian in Mexican culture, to be a Mexican from an Anglo point of view. She learned to juggle cultures, 
She had a plural personality. She operated in pluralistic mode. Nothing was thrust out, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Nothing rejected, nothing abandoned. Not only did she sustain contradiction, she turned the ambivalence into something else. This is a modified uh, quote from her. She's still speaking of herself. She could be jarred out of ambivalence by an intense and often painful emotional event which inverted or resolved the ambivalence. I'm not exactly how, she says. The work takes place underground, subconsciously. It is the work the soul performs. It is where the possibility of uniting all that is separate occurs. This assembly is not one where several or separated pieces merely come together, nor is it a balancing of opposing powers. In attempting to work out a synthesis, the self has added a third element which is greater than the sum of the several parts. That third element is a new consciousness. And through it is a source of, an, and though it is a source of intense pain, its energy comes from a continual creative mo uh, motion that keeps breaking down the unitary aspect of each paradigm. The problem, she says, is to heal the splits that occur in the very foundation of our lives, our culture, our language, our thought. That constitutes a massive uprooting of dualistic, now I will use my language, types of awareness that constitute our sensibilities. In that transformation as she presents it, nothing remains enslaved, and the images of all manner of hierarchies begin to fade. I find Anseldua's experience and understanding to embody a kind of mercy that is possible in a highly diversified society in our own lineage in which distinctly and often extremely different cultures edge each other. I expect that such societies and lineages, I expect that in such societies and lineages, destructive, frequently cruel divisions ordinarily happen unless significant changes occur in guiding images, authoritative knowledge, hierarchies and modes of normal behavior and practice. I expect that such healing change will happen, as Ansel Dua says, with considerable pain and emotional upheaval. I expect, too, that as we consider issues of freedom and oppression, we are considering this kind of change in ourselves as well as in, in our environments, that mercy can replace cruelty in many situations only at the cost of such upheaval, and that in the lineages that most affect me, cruelty will inevitably constitute parts of the processes intended to generate mercy. Uh, the last page and a half is just a matter of review and summary, and I think I will close here. Thank you. Thank you for your paper, um, Johanna Latrell on philosophy here. Um, I was reminded at the beginning of your paper um, of a could book by just, Sorry. I was reminded at the beginning of your paper of a book by Toni Morrison called A Mercy. It's a historical fiction novel, and in it she outlines this move from indentured servitude to slavery in early America. Do you hear me? I'm just going to come closer. Okay. Yeah. Go, go, go right ahead. It'll help if you stand in front of the speaker here. Okay. Um, so in it, Toni Morrison outlines the move from indentured <coughs> servitude to slavery um, in early America. And she sort of sets the scene in early America such that it's only possible for mercy to happen in a context of cruelty such as that. And I think that's indicative, something about that is indicative of mercy as such, that I would only give, if I was in a position of power, I would only grant you mercy as a sort of temporary reprieve from this sort of hierarchical structure that one, um, that we're sort of in the place of it, which it constitutes a lineage or a situation in the words that you chose. Um, and so I'm wondering if we wanna call something what Ansel Dua has or this negotiation of borderlands, if we wanna call it mercy or if we wanna call it something like justice, which gets out of the hierarchy or the dualism, excuse me, between cruelty and mercy altogether and changes <coughs> um, the power structures for, for good, not in a temporary way. <coughs> 
I can see why uh, one might call it justice. Um, I also think that from the standards of justice, um, without mercy, mercy picks up where justice could operate in different ways. I don't really believe that the concept of justice is strong enough to include her reaching out to us angrily. And I don't think it's strong enough to include what sh she is going through with these multiple aspects of her consciousness, this borderlands consciousness. I don't think justice is strong enough to include the allowance that she is experiencing and reporting. Um, I, I think it goes way beyond uh, social justice, um, which is to say that if we look at it from the angle of mercy, not in any way wanting not to also wanting not to bring up issues of social justice as well, but if we look at it from the angle of mercy, we see something different from what we can see in a discourse that is uh, valorized primarily by the importance of justice. Justice has to do with the fulfillment of something axiomatic or, law or lawful. And you can meet the law. You can do what is legal and miss the entire ethical point. And um, I think that she is maximally aware of that. And I think it's very important when you began with the borderlands uh, situation where intrusion and encroachment might frequently be the just thing to do from within my own sensibility. But if I'm not aware of the cruelty that is part of my sensibility, and if I'm not aware also of the uniqueness of that sensibility, I may well carry out the justice that seems fit. And in doing that, act with enormous unconscious cruelty. I'm very, very worried about the, um, what constitutes different senses of justice. I, like you, have seen women beaten publicly or killed publicly because of the requirements of a sensibility's justice. I think that's ethically wrong within my own, my own purview. Put it another way, justice is not enough for ethics. Um, also, thank you for the paper. And um, I think that it is um, actually is something um, quite nice to see that um, um, something that uh, some of us have been uh, trying to do um, for a while, which is taking the um, writings or works of or, or uh, intellectual production of a number of intellectuals of color as a source for rigorous thinking about epistemology, ethics, and other areas. Uh, um, um, it's been done in this way. So I think that definitely... Um, there is a, a dialogue there uh, between what you just did and I think what a number of the people on the table and uh, have also been doing. So I think that that's very productive. I think also for the conversation, also it is that this kind of take is particularly important because in the United States, um, and you saw it when Huntington wrote, for instance, Who Are We? But, but actually, it's sort of as, w which in a way points to me, maybe I have a question there about whether there is not something in the United States that is more or less equal to Eurocentrism. When you read Huntington about who are we in the United States and going back to roots and going back to the founding fathers and to English and so on, it is, uh, I think it's a different form of hegemonic identity politics like Eurocentrism, but it is certainly qualifies as something like that. We can talk about the differences and not, but I think that there is a predominant discourse that is, if it is not exactly like Eurocentrism, it competes uh, 
very, very closely to it. And Huntington was perhaps the last ideologue that tried to articulate that for uh, a U.S. America in, for him, possible demise with the multiplications of the, these different others. Right? In that context, then it becomes official in a book, who are we trying him to tell us that this America is, is what it is because it has realized, it has, it has relied on um, Anglo-Saxon Protestant values on English as a language and not necessarily on those other aspects that people like you and me want to highlight and to show that they can serve as a model for thinking differently about that. So I think that only uh, going from the founding fathers and the founding political principles and English and Protestantism to in the Northeast primarily, to intellectuals who are in different parts throughout the United States uh, spelling out what their experience is, that that's actually something quite important that I think we'll see more and more in the 21st century alongside with the Huntingtonian um, behavior. So I think that will be sort of a, a, a clash in a way, <laughs> interesting, a clash between those who want to preserve that Huntingtonian uh, 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 American-centric view and those that will actually open themselves up to explain, to explore other intellectual sources. Now, my concern with, um, with what you are, how you are approaching Ansaldúa has to do that, um, or my own is to some extent, is um, about what may be, in, in lack of a better word, it seems to be a nationalization of her idea of the, borderland, the borderlands. So the in nationalization, in the sense that you're saying that the United States, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Europe, vis-a-vis -vis other places, that could be described as a borderless place, where Ansaldúa, on the one hand, as you read from the passage, she says, I'm not talking about, they, I am talking particularly about these physical borderlands in the Texas, U.S., uh, Southwest Mexican border. Uh, on the one hand, very particular, not to about the United States, but in a region of the United States, that we know that is very conflicted with violence because of that encounter between those cultures have been very violent. Right. So that's one. Yeah. And then second, she's saying that she's talking about these other borderlands that are psychological, sexual, and spiritual. Now, those features of the borderlands cannot, I think, be, or and she, her work doesn't necessarily lend itself for those features to be nationalized. So that, in a way, she's saying all of us, in a way, humanity itself Humanity itself uh, is constituted, is a borderland reality. Humanity itself. And if we go to that part of, the hum of humanity that we call the United States, actually where the Texas, U.S., where, where that mo border sort of lies, we see much, a lot of what we see is precisely, the, precisely because in a way the proliferation of those cultures is a massive attempt to deny the intimacy that she is asking for. So what we find in that U.S., rather than what, what we find in that U.S. is the borderlands, in a way, in, its, in, in a violent mode. Um, so what I find uh, sometime, um, what I feel with Onis about it is that somehow Ansaldúa was writing critically about that, the forces of coloniality in the United States as a whole, right? and talking about an idea based on how she understood humanity to be, an idea that cannot be particularly nationalized, and that somehow in your account, somehow that ideal is now posed over the nation. And so while you, I think, and I want to see her ideas, uh, her normative ideas, or the normative ideas that we find in her work as directions for all of us to think, you are unintendedly, or perhaps unintendedly, but tossing already the nation and eliminating a little bit the force of the negative of the of the violent and the other part, the oppression where your paper began. Um, there's so much in what you're saying. Um, I don't know that I can do it justice, um, but I do feel mercy with regard to it. <laughs> um, first, uh, just. Uh, sidebars. She also speaks of the colonial force, colonializing force of Mexico in her culture. She speaks of something analogous to the colonializing force of the um, 
male dominance. Um, and so I, I think it's more complex than, than that. I have reservations. We'd have to talk about this for a while. Uh, I'm not sure that the word nation, as you're using it, has fallen into enough question with regard to the United States. Uh, one can, and I see the justification for it. In fact, I was very conscious of it in writing this paper. Um, one can understand the United States by giving priority to the image and the notion of unity, of oneness, one nation, one people. Um, uh, that's certainly the traditional interpretation of the patriots, the patriots in this country. Uh, I don't believe it's uh, appropriate or accurate, and that's what I'm calling into question. As I see it, I'm not nationalizing Ansel Dewey. She also speaks of borderlands forever, as well as uh, owning the fact that the one I'm speaking out of is this one and this uh, uh, Texas-Mexican border, and of this particular group, which are rejected by all the other groups. Um, and so I don't believe she can be owned uh, by anyone, and least of all by someone like me doing a paper like I'm doing. I think she can be learned from. I think she can be a teacher. I think she can be someone who impacts one's awareness. And what happened when I, what happens when I read her is that suddenly I am aware that the thought of a unified country, I don't think there was ever a unified Europe either, um, but there was indeed a very powerful image that came out of a very powerful experience, um, which you're aware of in its detail much more than I am. I don't want to call that into question, but I am interested in keeping images in mind and the power of images. And when I see uh, this country in terms of borderlands of cultures, for example, second generation Af uh, African Americans find themselves oftentimes frequently totally alienated from what we think of as the black community. And perhaps you have read articles in which there are complaints that a lot of black people are trying, are being colonialized by un being understood as unified. We aren't, they say. That's a white myth. Um, and you had, I have to be awfully careful about that. And then when I see the, when I began to valorize the notion of difference as distinct to the notion of unity, things shift perspectively. And that's what I'm trying to do in part in this paper. And I think that Ansel Dua uh, just does a fantastic job of this in, uh, in what she is doing. And I think sheds light, um, perhaps unexpected light, on the Im importance of seeing this country, not in terms of the policies primarily of its government, seeing this culture as distinct to the policies that its government carries out. I mean, you and I probably don't have any differences on that particular score or as distinct to its patriotic, uh, patriotic rhetoric. Um, and, I mean, which forefather? <laughs> Hamilton, Jefferson, Madison, one of the Adams, uh, my Lord. And, you know, I, but my own opinion is we're still suffering from Jeffersonian democracy. Um, but that is one lineage and tradition. There are so many lineages and traditions and uh, I think to unify them comes out of a, uh, a mindset that I am trying to counter because I do think, and I say this gently, that that mindset is inclined to colonializing moves. Um, and so I would play with difference more. And um, I would put the notion of one nation in question, and I would raised to the top of the list the importance of the extraordinary social diversity that is now the case in the United States, and it is this are the, those are the sites where I think the greatest internal oppression is going on. Uh, there's much more that should be said. I don't, y if you want to continue it, uh, I'm fine about that. Uh, Walter? <laughs> 
funciona. Se escucha, ¿sí? Yeah. So, thank you, too. Um, two points. Um, <coughs> the way I was listening your presentation, which is, I really appreciate very much, is as a white person who has a kind of tremendous insight to understand <coughs> the sensibilities of the minority groups in the United States. And in that sense, I was listening to you as a powerful discourse to the white population of the United States. Look what we have to do in order to, well, I don't know as Nelson say, I mean, to kind of solve the problem of tension in, uh, in, in the United States under uh, a nation that is unite according to one sensibility that is the kind of hegemonic and dominant. So that is, you correct me, I have interpreted, I didn't interpret you uh, correctly, but that is the way I will understand you. So the first point is that that is nice, but uh, at the same time, as a uh, in Argentina and in the United States, I feel closer to Ansaldúa uh, than to the Anglo sensibility. But also in that sense, I appreciate your effort to invite uh, this kind of dialogue uh, with, um, uh, uh, with the minorities. And from that, I was kind of thinking of two things. Number one, I appreciate what you say about uh, borderline culture, but they were suspecting at what moment the power differential, will oh. uh, the power differential, because the borderline, and, and as always is clear about that, it's not just there are two sides of the border. There is a kind of borderland, uh, there is a, it's a power differential in the borderland, mm -hmm. and her discourse is on the one hand a self-affirmation that is being addressed on the one hand to the Anglo, but on the other hand to all the other kind of uh, minority groups in uh, her situation, right? So that leads me to the second point, and it's your last paragraph that I would like to reread because I think it's very important. Well, not the whole paragraph, but uh, when, he's, when you say, I expect that such healing now, a footnote here. This is very interesting because George Tinker, for example, in an article about corns and Jesus, I mean, George Tinker, you know, the, uh, the Native American theology and uh, theology of liberation. Uh, he does a very, he go into a very interpre uh, 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 interesting interpretation of the word Jesus. Tell me which uh, sentence you're on. I'm sorry, I haven't found it yet. No, 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 I am a kind of, uh, the. Uh, uh, I, I am kind of putting a footnote here about healing. The last paragraph, page 24, yes. I expect that such healing. So I stopped there and began a kind of uh, uh, footnote because uh, now it seems to me that it's very important. Because healing, I mean, the, the, uh, the interpretation that Tinker does of uh, Jesus, uh, he, he interpreted the word Jesus and, uh, and, and I take it to be a healer, not the savior. But the institutionalized Christianity took Jesus as the savior and by institutionalizing Christ, the institution of the church became the savior of the poor. But the becoming the savior of the poor kind of exercise cruelty uh, in, in those who pretend to uh, save. So now I, I continue. No? So if we think about healing, so we are going to, we began to, uh, if, if we think Jesus uh, as a healer, so we began to move in a different direction in connection to uh, theology of uh, liberation. So I expect that such healing change, change will happen, as San Saldua says, with considerable pain and intense emotional upheaval. I expect too that as we consider issues of freedom and oppression, we are considering this kind of change in ourselves as well as in our environment, that mercy can replace cruelty. I like this paragraph. I'm just going to push it a little bit. Further. That mercy can replace cruelty in many situations 
only at the cost of such upheaval. And that, in the lineage that most affect me, cruelty will be inevitably constitute part of the processes intended to generate mercy. Now, if we we'll link that to the question of differential of power, then the question is, this is nice, but how do we move in that direction? <laughs> and so I see two, uh, two ways of moving in that direction. One, uh, and that they are not either or, they are kind of two ways uh, complement each other. Uh, one would be violence. And not violence, I'm not talking here about violence uh, in the sense of getting the guns. I'm talking about, the, for example, the violence of the missionaries in the conquest of America and kind of the violence of depriving, taking the identity of the indigenous away. So we have to, and how do we do it? And I think we have to go to the question of education and how do we relate ethics to education? And probably we have to remember here the de-schooling project that Ivan Illich uh, 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 launched uh, many years ago in, in Cuernavaca. But I think that this requires violence and this requires education. And the question is how do we link violent education in this upheaval of transformation that I'm, I'm sure that you said we the white, we have to go through this upheaval if we really want to uh, replace, uh, I mean, to, to kind of link uh, 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 to replace cruelty with mercy. Yeah. I, think that's a, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I don't, I have nothing but appreciation for your suggestion that the process that is going on in that last paragraph um, could well find one of its directions in radical educational reform. Um, having said that, let me back up one step. As I read and understand this paper, there is not a page in which my own authorship and the limits of my perspective are not put in question. The whole thing is conceived in part on limitations out of which this paper arises, and the uh, the inevitability of distortion on my part. I am also doubling back on that and saying that I expect that that is a necessary condition for all of us, is a process of putting our own authorship and our own perspective in question as we carry it out and how the hell do we do that? And I think Ansel Dua is a marvelous example of someone who has done that and doesn't reject a thing she finds there but lets a mutational process go on that is so hard to conceive and it's uh, so singular uh, that you know I stand in, in awe of it. Um, you, of course, I'm sure, uh, see that you would have as much trouble understanding Ansel Dua as I would. Uh, we are both, from her point of view, uh, alien, and we would both be seen as exemplary of, um, of uh, colonializers or uh, violent opponents by virtue of our, of our gender, if for nothing else, of our color, Argentinian, you know, and, and uh, from the United States, my Lord. Um, so the issue that's on the table at, for me is how each of us puts in question his or her own most cherished values and ideas in order to open up to the lineages that are operating in us as we cherish them. That is also true of organizing concepts such as nation, race, color. Um, the image is just around Native American, for example, even still. Um, the issue is how we ourselves put our own selves in question as we maintain what we find very important to maintain. How do we put our authorship in question and at the same time passionately pursue it?
And I think Ansel Dua does an absolutely superb job of that. And she says, with regard to the <laughs> thrust of your point, which I don't know how to handle um, in, in its specific detail, I just don't know enough. But she says that her she found her means in words. Mm -hmm. And it's in language. And it's in her own language, not yours and not mm -hmm. mine. It's in her own language, and that she found that as her outlet, limited though it is. But if a person can also, I have a former student who is very, very involved in educational reform and has a lot of experience in Latin America, um, and is working on that very kind of issue, and I think that's a terrific direction to go. Um, what I'm, in the language from this morning, I understand myself to be involved in a process without any kind of definitive um, telos, but a process of transformation that I think is extremely important mm -hmm. so that we don't become, we don't fall prey to the really violent and if sometimes cruel aspects mm -hmm. of our most just, right, and passionate causes and values. Can I have just one small thing, no, no, not to answer, but just for the Please, conversation. Please, I welcome it. Because, I mean, I was thinking also that the, the third point, to, to connect with uh, what Sam was saying this morning, and was a question from the audience about the... What you might want to speak closer to the oh, microphone. What is the, uh, I mean, if there is a common, it's a common ground uh, between the consensus of the dissenter and the consensus of the hegemonic. And the question, Enrique, is uh, what happens when dissenters are dissenters within the system of domination? So I think that this is another kind of dimension that is very important in the kind of uh, discussion and the struggle that we are involved in. And how can we work together? And that's what I appreciate in your intervention. Yeah. Thank you. Well, everyone, uh, we're, okay. we're over time. Uh, actually, um, we have... Uh, we have an hour at the end for discussion. We can we can keep talking for a few minutes as, as if, if the table has more discussion. This is the idea of the conference that we have a conversation, and we have leeway at the end. So please let's let's keep going. Um, yeah, I uh, just quick comment. I, I love the way you started with your. Uh, uh, I, by the way, I love the way you started with your personal experience or the connection you made at the end with uh, Gloria and Saldua. Um I was wondering, in a few places in your paper, uh, you mentioned art. And in fact, in the context of Ansaldúa, you right. say, above all in art that will overcome the tradition of the mestiza silence. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the conversation here about the, the, the means, right, the means of transformation, I think we often, at least in philosophy, uh, we, uh, we, we forget art. I mean, we talk about political means right, of transformation, and we talk about uh, educational means of transformation, but then there's also art, and, and I think in, uh, this is very relevant in the context of Ansaldúa because Tejano music, I mean, this is mestizaje, I mean, this is the meeting of uh, different lineage, right, and different sensibilities, and I wish we would pay more attention to what goes on in art, uh, and I, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I agree entirely. Uh, Ansel Dua's choice was art. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, um, poetry is part of art as far as I'm concerned. But also, I, the way I read her book is that it requires um, alertness and attunement to its artistic dimension to understand it. When I first read it, I read it as a philosophy book, and I hated it. I thought, good night, you know, what kind of theoretical, conceptual discipline does she have? All I could see was the absence of it. And after I read it a second time, I thought, you know, Scott, you're an idiot. <laughs> you missed the whole damn point. <laughs> you missed the art of it. And it is, that's where I experienced the transformative power and suddenly realized this is, this is a presentation that has to do not only with this locality, or with universal concepts, or with a transcendental anything. This has to do with a process. Mm -hmm. And in that process, she, in this art, is reaching out, not hugging it, 
not saying the rest of you get away, but she is reaching out. Now that's where I find um, a kind of mercy that I myself am not quite capable of. And so I, ended, I wanted to end with her voice, which is an artist's voice, and which considerably exceeds my range. So I'm, I'm with you 100%. I was going to ask exactly oh, that sorry. point, but I thought we were over, so that's why I said later. But if I could just add on quickly, because it's, I think it's not just that she's an artist speaking, but that, that aesthetic realm might be the key to unpacking a lot of these hierarchies, which actually plague in part what we even heard this morning with that question of some of the dualisms that continue to yeah. set up hierarchies that create injustices, which in turn create cruelty. And I think if you look at the history of what happened in Latin America, um, the atrocities took place in the name of universal life ethics, yes. not aesthetics. So uh, <laughs> as I'll talk about <laughs> on Sunday, um, <laughs> aesthetics is kind of the foundation for transforming society, seems to be a much less cruel and also a much more spacious realm of freedom because that's also, I think, something that's pulling on Saldua to art is that there you have absolute freedom. And I liked what you said there mm -hmm. in terms of this um, place where nothing remains enslaved. Because even if we go back to traditional treatises, canonical ones on aesthetics, that is the realm of freedom with the genius and new rules for society. Whereas ethics traps us into a lot of the same. And I, I'm not saying we should break from ethics, but maybe if we model our ethical views on aesthetic principles, we would be in a position to be more open and end the sorts of tyranny that you were so nicely depicting there. So, well, um, I like the word aesthetics insofar as it really has to do with a kind of perceptiveness um, and the. Yeah, and the sensibility. Yes, yes, exactly. They, it the goes together. Is not necessarily about breaking aesthetics. Um, if I take ethics as I want to do, not primarily as a discipline but as referring to ways that we live together, uh, then I can bring them together, ethics and the art, the aesthetics, uh, better. And, and I do want to understand aesthetics primarily as a discipline of understanding or grasping or conceiving uh, of what I would do if I were an artist. Um, you've got to speak out of it and not just to it, uh, as I understand it. But in any case, I, I like this more spacious realm. Um, would you, would you agree by, uh, with me when I say that cultivating this spaciousness constitutes a way of life and in that sense is definitively ethical? Insofar as ethics refers to how we live together in common or together. In any case, I'm putting the word ethics considerably, I'm using it in a, a totally intolerable way in a philosophy conference. Um, but I, th I think one of our the spaciousness of the space is that we don't have to right. be strictly uh, philosophical as we work on some of these things that cannot be grasped conceptually and find out how do we attune ourselves to them and how do we speak out, out of that attunement or how do we create out of that attunement, how do we paint, whatever. I'd be hesitant to, I, I like what you're saying about the, the form of life, but I, I don't know if I would want to fall into, it's hard to talk about that without falling into hierarchies again, but um, the way you put it just now, again, puts the ethical as sort of the foundation. And I think of work, well, it's not a word that really fits here that well, but the aesthetic education of humans, you know, or of man, as Schiller put it. Um, I think an aesthetic education, this attunement that's so necessary for what you were talking about in the paper, comes from an aesthetic perspective, understood in a wider way, you're right, than a disciplinary sort of, you know, third critique Kantian aesthetics, but um, a sort of attunement to life that involves feeling and thought, as you also highlighted nicely in your paper. And I think that's sometimes missing when we bring up the ethical because it excludes it is um, sometimes missing mm -hmm. and it's also sometimes missing we deal with the aesthetic mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're right.
Well, um, it led me to a lot of reflection, especially the discussion. So I, um, I had a, a well, maybe a couple of observations. Um, one, I wanted to go back to Nelson's point because it, I also took a lot of the Anzaldua discussion to reflect on the American experience, the American experience, um, not necessarily in terms of nationalism, but how can we live together in North America or something like that. And um, that led me to think about, and, and I think Nelson was asking, well, is it just the American experience or is, I mean, well, not, not just, the, he said other things, but is it human, is it that Gloria Zaldua was thinking precisely about the Mexican uh, US border, but also about humanity at large, but also about humanity at large, and not just about the United States as a, some sort of nationalist project. So I think if you switch the, her, her, um, contribution to uh, a better understanding of what it's like to experience diversity or difference, I, you know, in, in this part of the world. It then reminded me of, of all this pain that you're talking about, about how the Cuban experience, if you might, because I'm born in Cuba, that, and the, this whole thing about the pain and the, the splits and the, and the mercy, the theme of mercy, and it comes out in song <laughs> of some of these young Cuban singers, perdonar, to forgive, because they see, you know, 50 years of opposition and, you know, of, of just like sides that don't speak to each other in part. And there's this, this question of how is it possible to deal with all the differences and, um, and also talk about our identities. So I don't know. These are some of the, and, and, and then uh, then my mind went to the to the uh, so-called transitions to democracy in Latin America, because this whole this whole speech about mercy, um, this we had this debate in a lot of Latin American countries, not in not in the context that you bring it up here, but out of all those dictatorships and uh, all those people that were murdered and disappeared, and then there were changes into more, say, a little bit more open societies. And people in each country had to deal with, should we, you know, what do we do to carry out justice? Or what do we do to, how do we deal with a memory of the pain? And what do we do with the people who murdered, you know, our own people or my family or my daughter or whatever? So I think these are really, really deep questions that, I mean, I've gone all over the place, but <laughs> I think that provoke our, our thinking and rethinking about these issues. And so the question of justice versus forgiveness here, we have had long, long, long debates, and I think in Latin America people still struggle with these, um, with these different ways of approach um, the experience. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, and uh, thank you uh, to Charles Scott for the paper. We will meet uh, uh, back at 1.40 to continue.